So we're going to move on to chapter 15, which has to do with blood. And we're going to speak about uh, the components of blood. And probably today we'll get through plasma and erythrocytes. And then after the exam, we'll talk about white blood cells, clotting, et cetera. Okay. So probably the first three bullet points here is what we'll get through today. Okay, so looking at the composition of blood, we know that blood is made of several parts, right? We can't really see those parts when you look at blood in a gross way, like if you're bleeding or if you look at blood that's being taken. But we know that there are several other uh, smaller components to blood, including a lot of fluid, which we call plasma. Now, astonishingly, a lot of our blood volume, right, that five liters, is circulated through our heart per minute. We can also equate this five liters to cardiac output, the amount of blood that is circulating per minute. So it's kind of really amazing that every minute we circulate our entire blood volume through the heart. Um, now we can look at what the different components are in blood by centrifuging that blood, which is a really fancy word for saying spinning it really fast and separating those parts out by density. And we know that the higher density or the heavier uh, substances fall to the bottom. And the lighter or less dense parts of blood rise to the top. And this is how we can determine the different components of blood. So 55% of blood is going to be plasma, that liquidy component of blood. Um, the less than 1% will be what we call the buffy coat. This is leukocytes, which are our white blood cells, really important in the immune function of blood, as well as the non-cellular fragments that we call platelets, and they are involved in blood clotting. We'll talk about those different components going on. And then the most important part of blood, which is the most dense part of blood, falls to the bottom, and those are the cells, the red blood cells or erythrocytes, right? And that forms about 45% of our total blood volume. Now we can deduce from centrifuging the blood, the hematocrit. And the hematocrit is the fraction of the actual erythrocytes to the total blood volume. And we see that it's about 42 to 52% for men and about 37 to 47% with women. And so it's a really important indicator of how much cells you have per your total blood volume, okay? That's what that hematocrit um, represents. Really important um, clinically in uh, determining the amount of healthy red blood cells and the oxygen carrying capacity of our blood. So we'll speak about each of these components separately as we go through. Um, so here we'll see that all blood, all blood cells come from a single hematopoietic stem cell. So this is a single undifferentiated cell that gives rise to all of our other cell lines, including platelets, although they're non-cellular, these fragments, they also arise from mag megakaryocytes, which are one of our precursor cells to blood. So I really don't want you to worry too much about these precursors. These final products down here are where we'll spend most of our time. Um, and today, specifically looking at the erythrocyte, which is the red blood cell. Okay, but the important point on this slide is that they all come from a single hematopoietic cell. So we'll start by looking at plasma. Now plasma is one of our fluid compartments. We've talked about plasma, plasma quite a lot already. It's 90% water, so most of it is just fluid in our body. It's part of our extracellular fluid compartment. We know that there's also proteins in plasma. What's the function of proteins in plasma? That's a clot. What's the function of proteins in our plasma? Yep, go ahead. Yep, the osmotic pressure that they create, which we talked about, remember those Starling's forces? And so having adequate protein in the plasma is really important to create that oncotic pull and to prevent disturbances which will lead us to excess filtrate or excess tissue fluid, right? Really important. Now, the majority of that protein, I keep mention th mentioning this, is um, albumin. Albumin is a really important protein. There are some other globulins and other fibrins in the, prote in the protein in plasma, but albumin is probably the most important um, component of those proteins. 
There's also electrolytes and electrolytes are in different concentrations. It's really important that they are in the appropriate concentration. Example is sodium and chloride, which are in excess in the extracellular fluid. And that's really important, right? We don't want our extracellular, uh, our plasma specifically to be uh, too high or too low in sodium. This is gonna create an iso, um, a hypotonic or a hypertonic fluid which can create problems for our red blood cells. If the fluid is too hypotonic, it's gonna pull water into the red blood cells, they're gonna swell and they're gonna light. So it's really important that we have adequate or appropriate concentrations of sodium and chloride out in the plasma. Um, and then we have lower concentrations of uh, protons, bicarbonate, potassium, and calcium. This is also really important. We're gonna speak a lot about acid-base balance. We know that protons, or hydrogen ions make the blood acidic, bicarbonate makes the blood basic, and it's really important to have those in the appropriate balance. We'll talk more about that when we look at the kidneys and the lungs where they um, contribute to acid-base balance. So a lot of important uh, other uh, functions of some of these electrolytes in plasma, and they must be regulated at, very, um, at the appropriate levels. Okay, so looking at red blood cells to start, we have a lot of red blood cells, about 5 billion red blood cells per milliliter of blood. And red blood cells have a uh, unique shape. They have this biconcave disc-like shape. And this is basically dimpling on either side. So although we can't see both sides of the red blood cell here, and I'm calling erythrocytes red blood cells, those terms are interchangeable. Um, Although we can't see the dimpling on both sides, we do see that concave uh, dipping or dimpling on both sides of the cell. And that is really important. Yep. Um, you may see either of those terms. Yep, they're the same thing. Okay. Um, I'll talk about leukocytes, which are sometimes called white blood cells. And again, you may see either of those terms on a test. Okay. All right, so um, large surface area, which is really important. That's what that dimpling brings about. And we know that surface area is important for diffusion, okay? So the slightest change in this shape can lead to dysfunction in the, fun dysfunction in the oxygen carrying capacity of the cell. So noting this shape is really, really important. And we'll go on to talk about sickle cell, which is an abnormal shape in the cells um, where they lose this biconcave disc um, shape. I'll also point out here the actual size of the red blood cells, not for you to memorize, um, it's not terribly important, but just to point out just how tiny these cells are. They're really, really small um, in their size. Okay. Now, because of some proteins on the membrane of red blood cells, they have a flexible membrane, um, and this allows them to be really malleable. They can squeeze through really tiny spaces like capillaries. They can go through the spleen. They can go through the liver because of this flexibility of their membrane. Now, erythrocytes or red blood cells don't have nuclei. They don't have organelles. They aren't able to make proteins. They cannot undergo oxidative phosphorylation or anaerobic glycolysis. All they can do is undergo typical normal glycolysis, which requires oxygen and which only yields about two molecules of ATP. So what does that tell us about the function of erythrocytes? What does that tell us about their function? So if they only yield two ATP, they can't undergo any of the other more efficient uh, mechanisms of generating ATP like oxidative phosphorylation. They can't build up lactic acid and generate um, ATP anaerobically. So what does that tell us about their energetic demand? It's very small. Yeah, it's very small. So they don't need to make a whole lot of ATP because they really only have one job. They have one job only, and that is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide. Okay. So in their initial uh, proliferation, in their initial uh, development, they do have organelles, but by the time they are a mature erythrocyte, they have lost all of the organelles, they don't have DNA, they can't undergo mitosis or divide, and so all they really are good for is transporting oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? All right, so let's look at exactly how they do this transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So, erythrocytes have hemoglobin molecules in them, and we're gonna look more closely at the structure of hemoglobin. 
So we have this globin component, which is the proteinous component of hemoglobin. It's basically forming these four subunits. We have two alpha subunits and two beta subunits. And we should know from prior knowledge that this is the quaternary structure of protein. So a lot of complex folding happening here that gives us this globular um, shaped um, hemoglobin um, made of four of those subunits. Now in the center of these subunits, we have the heme part of this. We have four heme groups which are located here in the center of each of these subunits. And in the center of those heme groups, we have iron. Now iron is the actual area that oxygen binds, and this is how hemoglobin is able to transport oxygen. All right, so I'll say that again. We have this hemoglobin molecule. It has four subunits, two alpha, two beta. In each of those subunits, we have four heme groups. And on the center of those four heme groups, we have four ions, and each of those ions can bind one oxygen each. Okay, so a hemoglobin can transport oxygen via the binding of um, this iron to that oxygen. And most of our oxygen is transported via hemoglobin. We have a small percentage that can be transported in the plasma, dissolved directly, but it's not very soluble in plasma, and so that's not a very efficient mechanism of transporting oxygen. Now, when oxygen is bound to that iron, because of differences in the way it interacts with light, blood appears bright red, right? This oxygenated version of hemoglobin appears bright red. Whereas when we have uh, no oxygen bound, the deoxygenated version appears 